Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the oceans and what we can do to help improve the status of the oceans and improve their health. The oceans are under stress because of humans and because of many other reasons. My guest today is an expert in this area. My guest today is Lauren Kubiak. Lauren Kubiak is an international oceans analyst with the Natural Resources Defense Council who works on the management and conservation of biodiversity and ecosystems of the high seas and the Arctic. Lauren, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you being with me today. Natural Resources Defense Council, that's yes. NRDC. You yes, got that exactly. down, that's a, that's a mouthful. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> it is a bit what, of a mouthful, What is yeah. the Natural Resources Defense Council? When was it formed, why was it formed? So the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, is an environmental NGO, and it was formed in 1970 by a group of young lawyers on the premise that people have the right to have clean air, clean water, and healthy communities, mm -hmm. and um, now over 40 years later, it's grown into an organization of over 500 staff um, with expert scientists, lawyers, policy experts, and over 2.4 million members and online um, uh, activists who uh, are really working to safeguard the earth and its inhabitants and all of the natural systems that, uh, that life depends on. And our viewers can go to your website at nrdc.org and get yes. more information about the Natural Resources Defense Council. Absolutely. We've uh, so I love to say that the scientific community is just giving us an ocean of information, mm -hmm. uh, oceans, oceans, if you will, of information on the uh, the detrimental effects of climate change. We see the glaciers are melting, seas are rising. We see there's overfishing taking place. Uh, it just on and on, the list uh, seems to never end. How, how prevalent is this problem that we're talking about right now? How much stress are the coral reefs under? How much stress are the fish supplies under? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The um, climate change is 100% happening. You know, 2016 was the warmest year on record. 16 out of the 17 warmest years on record have happened since 2001. And it's absolutely, scientists mm -hmm. are near certain that humans are causing climate change. And you really can't talk about climate change without talking about the oceans. Um, oceans rose about seven and a half inches uh, last century and mm -hmm. ice is continuing to melt. Uh, sea levels are gonna rise even more quickly in the future. And the ocean also is absorbing 93% of the excess heat that's been emitted since the 1970s. So. Um, this excess heat and the oceans are also absorbing carbon dioxide, the oceans are becoming warmer and more acidic and that's really putting a strain on the life in the oceans. You know, we've seen coral bleaching from um, in the Great Barrier Reef where the, the coral reefs um, can't survive because the oceans are, are so warm and uh, ocean acidification is also making it more difficult for shellfish and corals to um, create their skeletons. So. We're just, we're just only really scratching the surface of understanding these impacts, and um, so we do know that we need to combat them through um, international action. Mm -hmm. And there are also a lot of other effects that are taking place, and we might touch upon a few of them right now, just uh, the invasive species. This is turning into a major problem. What, what are invasive species? How do they move around, and what can we do to combat them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, invasive species are, uh, becoming a, a big problem and one example of invasive species is lionfish off of the coast of Florida in the United States and um, people aren't exactly sure how they're introduced but it's probably people who had them in their aquariums um, just didn't want them anymore and set them free into the waters and they're native to the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific so in Florida they have no natural predators so their populations have just exploded and um, one kind of fun thing that people are trying to do to, to combat these invasive species is actually to um, try and get people to, to eat them. So there are cookbooks on how to, <laughs> how to cook lionfish and just trying to build up demand for, for eating these invasive species because then it becomes kind of a win-win situation. Um, you know, three billion people in the world rely on fish as their primary source of protein and by eating invasive species you tackle um, you tackle that two issues with, um, with kind of one stone. And the best way to avoid invasive species in the first place is just to you know, try and prevent them from being introduced to ecosystems and to um, have early monitoring systems in place so before the populations can explode, you mm -hmm. really 
um, can can try and remove those from the mm -hmm. ecosystem. And I would hope the invasive species are tasty and edible. <laughs> we'll assume that that's <laughs> the case. Lionfish allegedly are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. That's good to know. Yes. Yeah. Other problems with the ocean. S the ocean. We we really should just say the ocean, not the Pacific, Atlantic, Arctic, Indian. It's really one big ocean, is it not? Right. The oceans yeah. are all connected, so it really is just one big ocean. Mm -hmm. I can see for geographical purposes, that, uh, geopolitical purposes, they would need to identify them. And mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. Uh, another problem that's undergoing, though, is pollution. Mm -hmm. How severe is this? And what are some of the major sources of pollution in the ocean? Right, so there's nutrient pollution in the ocean, there's plastic pollution, um, there's noise pollution from seismic um, activities, searching for oil and gas. So all of these stress, all of these types of pollution are really putting stresses on the ocean. Um, so for example, um, when excess fertilizer is applied on fields, then it runs off and mm -hmm. um, it creates kind of these algal blooms which suck all of the oxygen out of the water and create kind of hypoxic dead zones. And a good way to combat that is to, to employ precision agriculture techniques and to um, really only apply the amount of fertilizer you need so, so, so much doesn't wash off into the, into the ocean. Um, so again, you know, getting to the problem at the source is, mm -hmm. is a good way to deal with it. Do you find that the governments, private companies, agricultural interests, what have you, are becoming more aware of these problems and really m maybe want to do more about them today to overcome them as opposed to 20, 30 years ago? I think so. I think, um, you know, to give the example of climate change, we've seen tremendous business support for the Paris Agreement, the mm -hmm. agreement that was um, agreed to in December 2015, where 195 countries came together and agreed to all take actions within their own borders to reduce their carbon emissions and climate change causing emissions and limit global warming to two degrees Celsius by the end of this century, which is, um, which is a really significant action. And uh, if you look at the United States, you know, the companies supporting this are tremendous. There's, you know, from Apple to Amazon to Walmart, um, there's a huge amount of private sector support for, um, you know, tackling climate change. And we're also seeing the economic benefits of that play out as well. So. Um, in the United States, there's more than two and a half million people employed in clean energy, like renewable energy, like wind and solar, and energy efficiency, and electric vehicles. So um, those 2.5 million people in the U.S. are working in well-paying jobs that are helping combat climate change. They can't be outsourced, and uh, that's something that policymakers need to pay attention to, that um, curbing emissions really has a, uh, mm -hmm. an impact <coughs> economically as well as on the natural sy climate system that we all mm -hmm. depend on. Mm -hmm. And the, you talked about the United Nations climate, uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement that came out in 2015, I guess mm -hmm. it was Paris? Yeah, uh, December. December of 2015. And of course, that's a treaty that's moving forward very quickly. There are a couple of countries, the U.S. has not been actively involved recently, but this is a treaty that's going to move forward. And it has to because if we don't, we see, as we look over the horizon, we see some major problems, and the problems are going to get worse. They're not going to get any better. As you mentioned, we've encountered the hottest years, 16 of the last 17 or, or something like that, and we're on track this year to be even hotter than we were last year. Now, going back to some of the other problems with the oceans, ocean acidification. What exactly is this? You alluded to that a little bit earlier, but what uh, exactly is this acidification, and what are some of the sources there? Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the oceans are absorbing um, heat, they're ab absorbing carbon dioxide emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. And uh, by um, scientists have discovered that the oceans are about 26% more acidic than they were in pre-industrial times. And that's pretty significant when the chemistry of the ocean changes that much. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the organisms that use calcium carbonate in their s shells, like um, mollusks, like shellfish and corals, um, the different chemistry of the ocean is making it really hard for them to maintain their shells and to really survive. And, um, you know, we're, we really don't know what, um, what the eventual impacts are, how it's going to play out with, with plankton, um, plankton, the little microorganisms that are at the base of the food chain. Some of them have, uh, have shells that, that rely on um, less acidic waters to form. So, you know, there could be cascading effects with um, 
disrupted plankton and uh, goes all the way up to you know some of the top predators like whales. So um, we really need to invest more money in, in researching what the what's going to happen with ocean acidification and what the effects are so we can figure out how to better combat it because um, coastal ecosystems that, that rely on um, on seafood harvesting and uh, shellfish are really going to start to feel the the mm -hmm. economic effects. Mm -hmm. They certainly are. You mentioned earlier too about the plastic, the pollution in the ocean, the plastic bottles. We call these, they, the scientists <laughs> call them gyres, G-Y-R-E-S. Sorry, it took me years to figure out that term. <laughs> but anyway, they call them gyres. And these things are just where the convective currents come together. They're, they're miles and miles, I don't know how deep they are, but they're miles and miles wide. I saw a statistic a few weeks ago that said, if we continue at the rate we're going polluting the ocean with this plastic and all this junk, that the plastic will weigh more than the fish in the ocean by 2050. So I'm gonna have to follow up on that. I don't know if you've heard that one or not, but uh, there is a tremendous amount out there. One other thing too, you were talking about the, the shells, the eco skeletons and what have you, these, uh, the uh, marine life. And a problem we've had for years is the contamination of fish. We see the tuna maintains a large part of the mercury that it absorbs. We see that um, tilapia and others too, uh, sharks and, and uh, kingfish or whatever, are involved in this per uh, having this particular experience. But this is also getting into, th that's caused not only by pollution, but also with things like uh, makeup, eye makeup and things like that. Have you heard that? Uh, that th th there are many ways we're polluting the oceans mm -hmm. as far as really putting poison into the fish. Yeah, it's not just plastics, it's microplastics. So that's one reason that they tell you don't flush your um, extra medication down the toilet. Um, you know, everything that gets into the water stream can, when it's absorbed by the algae that's then eaten by the f little, the tiny fish, which are eaten by the bigger fish at every step of the food chain, whatever poison, be it mercury or another chemical that might be harmful to human health. It's all amplified, so keeping it out of the water source is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Now, we alluded earlier to the Paris Climate, tra Climate Change Treaty, and the UN has really been the epicenter of bringing together the countries of the world, the private sector, the non-governmental organizations, group like the, groups like that, to focus on these problems, especially in the area of climate change. That, it, it's been the United Nations, we won't go back through all the climate change conferences, but how important is it for the UN to play that role, to be a convener and to provide technical assistance, provide scientific information, and to bring these players together to focus on this problem? Yeah, the United Nations is absolutely critical in both climate change and also addressing our ocean health. Um, you know, climate change is a truly global problem. Our oceans uh, are a truly global problem. And you can't get to the root of the problem unless you involve everyone um, globally. So uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is a process that's going on right now to develop a treaty to protect the high seas, which is the area of ocean beyond national jurisdiction, so further than mm -hmm. 200 nautical miles from shorelines. And uh, all of that area makes up about two-thirds of the ocean and nearly half the planet. And right now it just lacks uh, modern safeguards to address biodiversity, to address um, protecting the marine life there. And so governments are involved in a process to develop a new treaty to really get at some of those gaps and better conserve the ocean. And um, you know, over a hundred governments are participating, and that's um, a really important mm -hmm. set of negotiations that we you know we need to get a strong treaty outcome to to protect the oceans, just as the um, the globe is acting to protect the climate. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps you're with a university or an educational institution that has some type of intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you'd like to share our programs, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how these issues impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at the, the oceans or the ocean, whichever you prefer to call it, and some of the 
adverse effects that are really being applied and are, are coming out of the ocean because of pollution, because of climate change, because of many other factors. My guest today is an expert in this area. My guest today is Lauren Kubiak. Lauren Kubiak is an international oceans and analyst with, with the Natural Resources Development. Defense Council, I'll get it. <laughs> I always want to say development. Uh, Lauren, we're talking about the uh, oceans and how important the ocean and how important it is. We're talking about the United Nations and that central coordinating role that it plays as a convener. One treaty that the UN came up with was the Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. What uh, Basically, uh, what does that treaty do and what is the status of it today? Yeah, so you mentioned the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and that was negotiated in the 70s and adopted in 1982 and actually went into effect in 1994. And that treaty um, is what you know put in place states' exclusive economic zones, you know, the 200 nautical miles out from coastlines. It set provisions on dumping, on navigation, and its article 87 also set something called the Freedom of the High Seas, which um, grants coastal states as well as landlocked states um, the freedom to navigate through the ocean, the freedom of overflight, uh, the freedom of scientific research. Um, and uh, um, also I mentioned that it was negotiated over 30 years ago. So it has gaps in it. It doesn't address biodiversity conservation. It doesn't address um, setting up protected areas. It just has a lot of gaps. So that's one of the reasons that we are in discussions to develop a new treaty for the high seas that will address some of these gaps and better protect mm -hmm. the, the high seas and all of the people that depend on it for their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And are we moving forward on developing this new treaty to fill in these gaps? We are moving forward. We just had uh, a really great set of discussions um, that wrapped up a few weeks ago where governments adopted a, um, by consensus, they adopted a report and a recommendation to the General Assembly to move forward with the convening of formal diplomatic negotiations, an intergovernmental conference that we hope will be uh, started in 2018 where countries will come together and actually start to put some of the text on paper and um, and get the uh, the treaty closer to, to finalizing. Mm -hmm. And this is so important that we do this because we do dep depend upon the oceans. We mm -hmm. absolutely must depend upon them. And uh, they've often been referred to as the lungs of the planet. And uh, that is certainly true to a large degree. The, uh, the UN has done a variety of things that as groups such as yours, NRDC, and various groups like that. One thing that the UN General Assembly did was come up with World Ocean Day. When mm -hmm. is World Ocean Day, and what is the significance of that as far as putting the spotlight on the oceans? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, people depend on the ocean for their livelihoods. Three billion people, in fact, uh, directly depend on the ocean for their livelihoods. And over 200 million people are employed in marine fisheries worldwide. So this is not insignificant in, in people's lives. And it provides 70% of the oxygen that we breathe. So it is, in fact, the lungs of the planet. So um, a day like World Oceans Day, which was on June 8th of this year, which fell on the Thursday of the, uh, the first ever ocean conference that was convened at the UN, um, brought together world leaders. There were a lot of heads of state here. There were fisheries ministers, environment ministers, and the main focus on World Ocean Day was to really call attention to the state that the oceans are in. You know, we've talked a lot about the pollution that they're facing, the climate impacts, and ocean acidification that's accruing in the ocean. And um, by engaging political leaders, it, there's really, you know, creating a lot of momentum to actually do something about solving these issues at the, um, at the UN Ocean Conference and for World Ocean Day, over a thousand um, governments, private sector stakeholders, non-governmental organizations made voluntary commitments to um, to take actions to sort of reverse the uh, the tides of degradation that the oceans are facing. So it was just a huge convening of of leaders and um, and calling for action and really building momentum to to do something about about protecting the oceans. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways that people can get involved. One is to learn more about the Sustainable Development Goals, which came online in 2015. They'll run over 15 years, or logical, practical, measurable goals to do, well, there are 17 of them to eliminate poverty, to eliminate hunger, to empower women. But 
goals, what, 13 and 14, I think, mm -hmm. dealt with climate change and conserving the oceans. And there are so many groups now that have already signed on to them, faith-based groups, conservation groups, businesses, a lot of private sector businesses, governments have signed on to them. Uh, how important is it for us to learn more about these sustainable development goals? Yeah, so the sustainable development goals, um, especially 13 or, and 14, are really focused on curbing climate change and protecting the oceans. And uh, I think they're a, a good baseline to, um, I know organizations that are educational in nature that sort of use the sustainable development goals as a baseline for teaching their students about the world and uh, some of the issues that the world is facing and some of the ways that governments and other people are responding to those issues. So I think the sustainable development goals are a good framework to kind of think about how we go about um, solving some of these global issues. Mm -hmm. And so often there are so many organizations such as Rotary International, Lions International, uh, just about every <laughs> religious group you can name, I guess, that are represented at the United Nations are involved in these, but so often, and I don't think it's for lack of trying, so often the members of these organizations, some of the members don't realize that they're actively involved in working towards these sustainable development goals. So it's important to communicate this, to get the word down to everybody in every organization how important these goals are. Before we run out of time though, you had alluded earlier to clean energy, which is very important because a large part of our problems has to do with pollution. We, d we see that we leave a large carbon footprint. We use coal, uh, less of a footprint with oil, maybe a little bit less with gas, but they're still fossil fuels and they're detrimental to the planet. Uh, how can we move, we are moving right now. Coal is a dying industry. It's uh, gas, gasification or uh, fracking has put it out of business, uh, if you want to look at it realistically. But the, uh, what can we, how can we move more quickly into clean energy, solar, wind, that type, th thermal, whatever it may be, and move away from these, this carbon-based uh, fuel that we're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, transitioning away from fossil fuels and really moving towards clean energy like wind and solar and energy efficiency are really critical to both reducing pollution and combating climate change. And uh, we're, I mean, we're already seeing a, a huge change, you know, um, solar in the United States and globally has increased an exponential amount in the past five years. Same with wind. Um, Hawaii and the United States set a renewable portfolio standard mandating that the amount of electricity that uh, its utilities generate has to, 100% of that has to come from renewable energy. And we're just seeing huge cost drops and a lot of, a lot of states, um, city governments really taking action to, um, to transition away from fossil fuels and move towards clean energy. And um, this you know, transition is happening a lot faster than a lot of people thought it would even, um, even a couple years ago. Uh, since 2008, the United States um, economy has increased by 10% and our emissions have dropped 9%. So um, you can see our economy still moving um, and growing while our emissions are dropping. And it's really kind of this trend that we're starting to see that we're um, emissions are really decoupled from economic growth, and that's a really positive trend that, that I think will continue and, and actually needs to be accelerated in order for us to meet our climate goals. Mm -hmm. And there are several countries around the world now that want to be fossil free, fuel free within the next 10, 15, 20 years. Some countries have even declared that they will not allow any cars into the country that are not battery powered or solar powered, powered or whatever. They've, they cannot use the old combustible engine. So there is a movement, as you mentioned, and literally hundreds, if not thousands of mayors and governors and political leaders around the world who are supporting the Paris Climate Change Treaty. And they're focusing their attention on that and they're working on it because they realize how important it is that we work together to overcome this problem because we're there, we don't have, as Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General, the UN said there's no plan B. Mm -hmm. There is no other planet. There is no other place to go. People can talk about colonizing Mars, the moon, whatever mm -hmm. they can talk about it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it just isn't going to happen. But it is very important that we focus on this problem. And I know the Natural Resources Defense Council is involved in this, as are many other groups. But Lauren Kubiak, I want to thank you so very much for being with me today and bringing uh, perspective to looking at the ocean and also clean energy to a large degree. But thank
thank you for a very interesting and a very informative program. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, my pleasure. So fun. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television. I'm Bill Miller.